so much for coming to talk with us about Steampunk. We're really excited to be here. I do have one announcement to make before we begin. Uh, if you guys have been here all week, if, if you've been here all weekend, you may have heard this already. But before we get started, we wanted to take a moment to introduce Comic Book Classroom. When, comic, when Denver Comic Con was first dreamed up, the founders wanted to ensure that today's kids get to experience the same joy that comic books brought us growing up. That dream is being accomplished through the funding of your ticket purchase to Denver Comic Con. Your ticket purchase funds our nonprofit educational program, Comic Book Classroom. Like our corral that you see up front, Comic Book Classroom teaches kids about reading, visual storytelling, dialogue, conflict resolution, and basic drawing. It brings in professional creators to show kids that making comics can be a real job someday. And coolest of all is that the kids create their own comic book by the end. Um, comic Book Classroom is a fantastic organization. We're honored to be here to um, help support their mission. Uh, now, please allow me to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have uh, Shauna O'Grady, Zach Lawhey, Adelina Esquivel, and Emily Paris. So we're going to provide a steampunk sampler for you guys. It is not comprehensive. We're going to share some of our favorites. We're going to go back to the roots of steampunk, and then we're going to uh, come up through modern steampunk. We're going to look at some fun things that are coming soon. Uh, we're going to cover a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and we're really excited to get started. So uh, Zach, Lee, Zach Lockie is going to start us off. Thanks a lot, Brett. Hey, thanks again, everybody, for being here. Um, steampunk. It's one of those labels that no one definition can truly define. Instead, as a literary genre and as an aesthetic, it's one of those things that most people just know it when they see it. This is one of the reasons it is so approachable, why it's so inclusive, and why the folks who are drawn to steampunk come from all walks of life and cultures that span the globe. Steampunk is in the eye or monocular of the beholder. <laughs> it seems that as of late, steampunk has reached a popular critical mass that reaches far beyond the realms of science fiction and fantasy fandom. This is spectacular from our point of view, coming from the Denver Public Library, that a literary genre has become, for some, an all-pervasive way of life. It's an agent for change, and that is one reason that we're so excited about. Another reason is, of course, that it's awesome. <laughs> so, if we were to define the literature of steampunk as set in and around the foggy, gothic, gaslit setting of the Victorian era, during Queen Victoria's reign between 1837 and 1901, when steam power and mechanical clockwork dominated technology, and science gained mainstream acceptance, then it would be appropriate to mention the ancestral period fiction that sets the stage for what we know about and expect from steampunk today. For today's steampunk literature looks back to and reimagines these innovative works from authors such as Edgar Allan Poe, Mary Shelley, H.G. Wells, and Jules Verne. These authors, their works, the genre they created is known as scientific romance, it can even be argued that modern science fiction evolved from these very same scientific romance authors. An element of this time period in general, as well as to each of the following trend-setting titles that is absolutely vital to our understanding of the genre and its point of view, is the advent of scientific thinking. Large-scale exposure to and acceptance of science, from biology to astronomy, to mathematics, to geology. In the resulting pursuit, just in general, towards scientific endeavor, all the risks that that entails, including, can perhaps be best represented by the publication of On the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin in 1859. Science, even when it stood in the way of other points of view, had come to stay. And obviously, science is the key ingredient to science fiction. Another element of the Victorian period that is vital to understanding these following authors, their work, is the magazine. This time period was the golden age of the popular magazine. Invention and progress had lowered the price of paper, making magazines such as The Strand in Victorian London affordable to the masses, when before only the highly educated and well-to-do could afford them. Many of the invention stories in early science fiction um, appeared in these magazines. 
including the works by Arthur Conan Doyle, H.G. Wells, and Rudyard Kipling. For an introduction to these serials, check out from the library Science Fiction by Gaslight, a history and anthology of science fiction in the popular magazine, 1891 to 1911. All right, so with no further delay, here are a few of the gateway books to steampunk, the ones I promised earlier, the ancestral works, that have hooked and connected so many creative minds across the oceans, across the decades. Fair warning, if you're not careful, you may yourself become addicted. And next thing you know, you're gonna look like one of these freaks. <laughs> so I've highlighted the following based on their steampunk elements. The similarities you'll find with them and today's steampunk literature. You'll be familiar with a lot of them, but you may never have really thought of them as the beginning of steampunk. The element of time travel is huge in steampunk literature. Rip Van Winkle, that's a high school read. Some Words with a Mummy by Edgar Allan Poe. A Connecticut Yankee and the King Archie by Wells. And The Star Rover, Jack London. These are all really well-known authors and titles. Flying Machines, another huge element. The Balloon Hoax by Edgar Allan Poe. Rover, The Conqueror by Jules Verne. With the Night Mail by Rudyard Kipling, and Horror of the Heights, Arthur Conan Doyle. <laughs> and lastly, fantastic inventions, fantastic discoveries. Frankenstein, one of the first science fiction novels as we know it by Mary Shelley. The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Robert Louis Stevenson. So, with this as the foundation, with this as the beginning, it's time to tighten your goggles and loosen your corsets. We're going to time travel to the 1960s and beyond, and Adelina is going to take over and delve into the evolution of the modern steampunk, what we know and love today. There have been a number of different explosions of, I'm going to talk about in the 1960s and the 90s, the first explosion of, of steampunk. And it may not look like a whole lot of steampunk when you got people on horseback riding through the West. But the Net Wild West series from 1965 to 1969 would place in the Victorian era. It was in set in the West, so you had cowboys there too, but you also had robots. Uh, Verne-esque technology, Jules Verne's like technology, and the creator decided to describe it as James Bond on horseback. In 1967, Queen Victoria's Bomb, uh, the novel Queen Victoria's Bomb, combined modern concerns about nuclear war with the Victorian era England. In 1971, Warlord of, of the Air by Michael Moorcock, the first in a series of three books uh, called, trilogy called The Nomad of the Time Strand, Streams. It's a precursor to often thought of as the precursor to modern steampunk. It's Victorian, Edwardian time period, England again, and alternative history. And we also again have the atom bomb being used back in time, got that time machine, and go back. 1979, time after time, we get that time machine. The H.G. Wells, we get H.G. Wells himself and his time machine and he pursues Robert Louis Stevenson through time, and thinking he might be Jack the Ripper, into the 20th century. In 1987, Internal Devices by J.W. Jeter, he coined the term steampunk in, 1966, in 1987, referring to his own work and the work of others for this new genre. There were lots of punks out there, steampunk, uh, just became another one. And internal devices has all the things of that time period. Espionage. All the things we think of as steampunk. Espionage, clockwork, automatons, and again set in Victorian England. 1990, The Difference Engine by William Gibson and Bruce Sterling was another kind of a little bit of a throwback with a modern twist. It was a scientific romance, takes place in Victorian Britain. Charles Babbage, mechanical machine, has 
brought about an information technology shift, and it has fundamentally changed the way that British society works. You no longer have this, the aristocracy. They've been brought down, and most of them hung. Uh, you have the elevation of the scientists, and based on things based on merit, it can bring about this great social change. The second explosion happened in the 90s, and it didn't go really well. It wasn't well received. Uh, a lot of it was thought to be quite silly. Uh, for example, Adventures of Bristow County Junior. It was quite fun and inventive, but it's Western, it's Western steampunk, and then they tried to make Wild Wild West the movie. Also kind of silly, big huge spider, the cannibal spider trying to conquer the West with an evil villain. Then here's some other, another example, Treasure Planet, a retelling of Treasure Island in space, in the sky. We have these sky pirates for the first time, very steampunk. The League of Extraordinary Men got made into a movie, but first it was a comic book series. And they also get to travel in time. This is an ongoing theme throughout Steampunk. And we also have the, uh, the children, City of Children, um, which is a very creative, we get a floating city, we get a mechanical sort of, horrible things can happen with this technology. And then Firefly happens. <laughs> And then Firefly happened. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was killed too soon. Died. Yeah. Exactly. And then it died. And it was not it was not fun for any of the fans. Um, and so I think that there was kind of this time during the 90s where steampunk was attempted and not really picked up. And I think that Firefly helped create this burgeoning, I mean, what would you say it was terminal mass? Mass. I don't know. Critical mass of popularity right now. Um, and I think that Firefly really helped kind of kick that back off. Uh, the first, there's an English author named Chris Wooding who writes uh, the Tales of the Kitty J series. And they are very Firefly esque. They follow the exploits of uh, Captain Frey and his irreparable crew. Um, and there's also, I mean, there's tons of other series coming out right now, uh, like the Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences, Bone Shaker series by Cherie Priest. She um, actually started writing a Southern Gothic mystery series of, called the Eden Moore series that follows a girl who's haunted by ghosts. And then she took on Bone Shaker and really kind of helped popularize the, the steampunk ethos, I guess. Um, lots of books coming out this year by popular author uh, Brandon Sanderson. His Mistborn series started out pretty much high fantasy, and then he has one that kind of dips its toe into the jacuzzi of steampunk. Um, and let's see. Uh, one more, the... Um, Lilith St. Crow is another horror fanatist who has taken on the steampunk series um, with the Iron Worm Affair is the first in the Bannon and Claire um, series. And then, of course, there are comics. The um, Adele Blanc set by Jacques Tardy were originally published in the 70s in French. They were finally released in English in the 90s and then re-released again by Fantagraphics in uh, 2010, I think. And that's really kind of when the popularity of that series took off. And um, Luke Besson has made a film out of it. <laughs> I love Luke Besson. Um, I think he did City of Lost Children as well. Um, and then, of course, there's also quite a few young adult series in this uh, steampunk genre. Oh, yeah. So, not only are there books, but there's also music. And so, 
the band Rush and the off teen series called Etiquette and Espionage. That one came out in December. The next one is coming out soon. I'm very excited. Um, and Etiquette and Espionage is kind of a precursor to the Parasol Protectorate series. It happens in the past. It's kind of confusing. I, I struggled with the, the plot lines because since people are supernatural, they don't age the same way. So it's like, is this 10 years before or like 50 years before? But it's really good. It's really good. Speaking of curses and conspiracies coming soon, I get the fun part. I get all the stuff that's coming out in the next uh, three to six months or a year. Um, so, curses and conspiracies is the second book in the Young Adult um, Finishing School series from Carragher. Uh, the third volume of the Soulless manga is coming out as well. There are tons of new books in. <coughs> The series that we've been talking about in, in great steampunk series. Um, Sherry Priest, Devin Monk um, is one of, Emily's going to talk about a little bit more, but the next in that series, and Age of Steam is coming out in July. And uh, then we've got some things that are getting a lot of press. The last uh, volume of the Infernal Devices series by Jeter is coming out. Romulus and Buckle in the City of the Founders is getting a lot of press um, as being the steampunk novel to watch this fall, actually this summer. The Romulus and Buckle will be out on July 2nd, and um, there's just nothing but good about this book as throughout the library world, um, steampunk circles, so keep an eye out for this one to hit pretty big. And then Walking Your Octopus is the book um, that's coming out from the webcomic. Um, just fun and entertaining, but with a steampunk vibe to it. There are tons and tons and tons of steampunk romances coming out. Um, it seems to be a very easy and popular genre to apply steampunk aesthetic to. So um, just a few of the sampling that are going to be coming out in June through August. Um, and the Clockwork Fairy Tales is a collection of short stories that have been steampunk. I had to include Her Grace's Stable because they describe it as a Jane Austen space opera. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm kind of anxious just to see what that's going to be like. <laughs> and that it's steampunk at the same time, so um, it could be very interesting. Uh, the other cool stuff that's happening with steampunk that where it's really reaching beyond literature and getting involved with other stuff. Um, I'm sure those of you who have been keeping up with the steampunk movement have heard that um, Lego is going to be offering steampunk bricks. What? <laughs> <laughs> In July, the fourth um, level of their Master Builder series is going to be coming out. I try to get a hold of them. Even their salespeople don't know what the bricks are going to look like at this point. Um, but sometime soon, you should be seeing steampunk themed Lego. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know if anybody has been watching. There's been a lot of um, crowdsourced steampunk out there. The when Matthew Ennis, uh, uh, I can never say it right. From the oatmeal, Inman. Yeah. Matthew Inman from the oatmeal um, found out that the property that one of Tesla's last uh, workshops in New Jersey was going to be basically sold off for scrap. They he joined up with a committee of people that were trying to get a museum developed there, and they raised over a million dollars through a crowdfunding project, and they just brought the property, so be on the lookout if you're into Nikola Tesla, they're going to be probably crowdfunding the actual museum itself, but they now have the property that his old workshop was on, and including some buildings that are still in disrepair and everything, so that's kind of cool. Um, Cowboys and Engines is a steampunk movie that has also been crowdfunded through Kickstarter. Um, 
should be coming out within the next uh, six months or so. Uh, they've already started filming. It's actually got uh, a named cast and everything. Um, it has I'll have to double check on that, but it's, it, there's big names on it. I'm not sure how they managed to pull it off, but that will be coming up. And they also kickstarted a project for turning Neil Gaiman's short story Study in Emerald into a board game card game, and that got funded. So it's kind of cool to see that this, the community is coming forward and saying, we really want more of this and we're willing to pay for it. I don't know if anybody's heard the press, but Bruce Box Lightman has gotten behind a steampunk TV series project that is getting tons and tons of press um, in the early stages. They are really excited about it. They don't have a release date for when it will air, but keep your eyes open for Lantern City. It's looking to be pretty interesting. Okay, so the first time that I was really ever exposed to the steampunk aesthetic, <coughs> 1996. I was in sixth grade. I was watching MTV, and that was when they still played music. <laughs> Not shows like 16 and Pregnant. I don't watch that. But I was watching MTV, and the Smashing Pumpkins came on. Oh, I love them. And then Tonight, Tonight, it's a great tune. But what really like, drew me in was the video. The video was shocking, and it's aesthetic. It was so different. And then you start looking into it, it's based on a Victorian era, 1902, French film, A Trip to the Moon, which in itself is loosely based on Jules Verne from Earth to the Moon and H.G. Wells, the first man to the moon. And so both are Vic Victorian scientific romances. It is so steampunk. I had no idea. <laughs> Emily mentioned music and steampunk, and it's an inspired combo. Uh, and so if you Google uh, steampunk music, especially when you're at work, you'll have successfully <laughs> made your day that much better. Because you won't be able to do any other work. <laughs> Just don't tell my boss. That's what I do every day. <laughs> okay, so we're at Comic-Con, and uh, I, I would feel remiss if I failed to mention Batman. Gotham by Gaslight, 1989. It's a comic portraying the adventures of Victorian era Batman and pits the caped crusader against the likes of none other than Jack the Ripper. After fooling all of London, Jack the Ripper thinks he can fool him anywhere, including Gotham. So, ha, huh, we'll see what happens there. <laughs> Batman, he unfortunately doesn't drive a steam-powered Batmobile, but there are plenty of other steampunk elements. And the comic features artwork by Mike Mignola from Hellboy and P. Craig Russell from The Sandman. So, really great rendition. Okay, you can't talk about steampunk without talking a little bit about sex. Well, I suppose you could, but whatever. <laughs> because, you know, at some point, everybody's got to let off a little steam. <laughs> oh, boy. From the great minds who brought you the steampunk's guide to apocalypse, which focus on the specific steampunk contraptions you'll need to survive the end of the world. Now comes the steampunk's guide to sex. It's your definitive guide. I'm oh, sorry. It's your definitive guide to the sweaty side of steampunk. I'm trying to make you happy. The book covers all kinds of crazy Victorian sweaty stuff, as well as ideas about uh, 21st century. Okay, so. You know you might be a steampunk if you light the Bunsen burner instead of a candle to set the mood. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> the prestige. This one is a clear example of the steampunk genre in film. The story takes place during the Victorian era, and it deals with matters of the machine, both its usage and what it could mean for the individual who uses it. It's also a great example of how steampunk is not only science fiction, but it's historical fiction as well. Tesla is a real inventor, and his invention was actually real. Uh, it was called the magnifying transmitter. In reality, though, it really was just made for the wireless transmission of electrical energy, not to clone, you know, Hugh Jackman. Although, I guess it'd be great for some people. <laughs> <laughs> the movie is from 2006. And it's directed by Christopher Nolan, uh, known for his Batman trilogy, and he wrote the story for the upcoming Man of Steel Superman movie. 
And it's based on a 1995 novel, the same name, by Christopher Priest. So, um, let's see, The Prestige is actually, we're very excited, you guys, about June. This is one of four movies that will be part of the Denver Public Library's first annual steampunk film series, starting this Tuesday and running through the end of June. Every Tuesday this month, starting at 6.30, running till 9, steampunk movies will be playing in the basement of the library, Central Library, downtown, Broadway, and 13th. The movies are free. They're open to the public. Concessions will be available. Costumes are encouraged. Join us for a steampunk movie party. <laughs> we have flyers with the dates up at our uh, fan table next to the exhibition hall. So check that out. Some of my favorite picks are, I love Terry Pratchett, and Terry Pratchett and then steampunk together just kind of blew my mind. It's a street urchin as a hero, and you get to basically Terry Pratchett's version of Dickensian, Dickens, London. You get to meet Dodger, who likes to kind of spend a lot of time in the sewer, but you still like him. <laughs> you meet Dickens and Mr. Disraeli, who was often, was actually a person and was a very, was a spy. Uh, and we get to sort of learn more about him. Charles Darwin and even Sweeney Todd. Steampunk, an anthology of fantastically rich and strange stories. There are 14 stories set everywhere but Victorian England. Appalachia, future Australia, Wales, and an alternative California. It pushes the borders of what steampunk is, as well as defining it at the same time. And then I get to do a little. And I talked a little bit about the different engine. I would highly encourage you to actually read it. <clears throat> Lovely combination of both steampunk and science. And a little bit of history thrown in. But don't worry, it's not intimidating. <laughs> I can't not talk about Firefly and Sanctuary. I love these series. Sanctuary started out in 2007 as a web series and then got picked up in 2008 by the Sci-Fi Channel. And it was awesome. It was. Yeah, it's really good. They painted it. But you can, you can get back, you, you can get all the seasons at the Denver Public Library. You meet Dr. Miss Helen McManus and her team of experts that all those things that go bump in the night, yeah, they're real. All those monsters are real. And they need help sometimes from humanity. You get to meet some of her friends, Nikola Tesla, Dr. Watson, the Invisible Man, Jack the Ripper, and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I could go on forever about Firefly, so I'm just gonna say it's Space Western. It's got great characters. Please check it out. <laughs> Doctor Who. Okay, Doctor Who in its new incarnation, its new series. When it started out, there was a sort of abortive attempt here in the United States to say in 1996. It was a collaboration of British and American, and it became a TV. It became a movie a made-for-TV movie that aired. If you don't know who the eighth doctor is, this is where he is. You can also get it from the Denver Public Library if you'd like to. Or, yes, there's all sorts of other sources, but I'm talking to Denver quite a bit, as much as I can. Yes. Now, the new Who series from the very beginning, from when it started in 2005, has had a steampunk twist. Even the inside, the console of the TARDIS has been makeshift and cobbled together and has had a very steampunk sort of design. Every time you go to the Victorian era, you go to the Victorian era steampunk England or Wales. <clears throat> that, I gotta talk about some of my favorite series. Thank you. <laughs> so I already mentioned the Chris Wooding uh, Tales of the Kitty J series, and I'm going to select it as one of my favorites. 
this guy rocks. First of all, he's written like 20 books in the past 15 years, so grrr, but don't hold that against him. So, Captain Frey really only cares about one thing and one thing only, and that is his ship, the Ketty J. And he's willing to do anything to keep her in the sky, including resorting to piracy. His crew is ragtag and irreputable. He's got Crake, a demonist with a horrible past, a doctor who's trying to drink to forget, and Jez, a woman who's running from a most terrible thing. When he's offered a deal to too good to be true, he should know better, but money can cloud any man's mind. So Frey and his crew embark on their most dangerous mission ever, and when things go wrong, he realizes just how much trouble he's in. This was like Firefly, but with more magic. It was wry, fast-paced, weird west, and steamy. The crew of the Ketty J are totally worth following. Awesome series. Um, another series that I was just blown away by is The uh, Age of Steam by Devin Monk. <clears throat> the first one is called Dead Iron, and in it we meet Cedar Hunt, who is a man with a past, though not too much of it gets revealed. It's mostly hinted at in this first one. But because of this past, he keeps himself separate from the people in the small town that he lives in, which can be a very dangerous thing in a small town. Uh, there's also Rose Small, who's another outcast. She's lived in Hallelujah her entire life, but she was found as a baby. So that's kind of always had an outcast effect on her. Um, she's also kind of weird. She likes to devise things. Her hands are always fiddling with bits of metal and then turning them into like, you know, little wind-up birds. And then uh, girls aren't supposed to devise things in Hallelujah. Um, and then there's also Mae Lindstrom, who is a witch, and she lives outside of town with her black husband, which causes lots of problems. Um, and she mostly just comes into town to bring in the blankets and lace that she makes. Her husband, Jeb, went to find some work a couple months back, and he never came back. The thing is, when they got married, May bound them till death did they part. And so she knows that he's still alive out there somewhere, trying to get back to her, but for some reason, he just can't make it. And then there's Shard LaFell, who's brought progress to the town of Hallelujah by, he's the, pioneering laying tracks across the, the nation so that he can increase trade? Or is it something darker? And with the help of Mr. Shunt, this guy with creepy needle-tipped fingers, he might just succeed in his darker mission. Um, this book was riveting. I read it in one afternoon. It was awesome. Can't recommend this series highly enough. And then an oldie but a goodie is the Foundling series by uh, D.M. Cornish. He's an Australian who spent 10 years world building this series. He has notebooks full of illustrations that made their way into this awesome series. The, the pictures always left me wanting more, and I'm a total word geek, and he makes up a lot of words, but then he doesn't expect you to just kind of guess what they are. He gives you an explicarium. It's like the last third of the book. Uh, <laughs> so, Rosamond Bookchild is an orphan, a boy with a girl's name, and he's about to begin his lifelong career of sailing the vinegar seas. Except that Madame Opera's estimable marine society for founding boys and girls has decided that he's going to be a lamplighter. Not glamorous, not full of adventure, boring. Or so he thinks. Rosamond unfortunately begins his new life on the wrong foot by boarding the wrong boat and then falling in with some very unsavory characters. But this book is so cool. It was a great series. There's three of them and I just want more, 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 more. <laughs> um, let's see. I also want to talk about the Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences by Philippa Ballantyne and T. Morris, which he doesn't necessarily always get credited, but they write it as a, as a team. In it, Miss Eliza Braun and Wellington Books Esquire are agents of a covert ministry in steampunk UK in the late 1800s-ish. It's kind of hard to tell. They take some liberties. But we begin our story, and Wellington Books is in a bad position. He followed the wrong beautiful woman, and now he's being tortured to death for information that he doesn't really have. 
But lucky for him, the renegade agent, Miss Eliza Braun, is coming to the rescue with her inappropriate amount of weaponry and her sharp attitude. Upon their return, as a sort of punishment for both of them, Eliza is reassigned from field work to assisting agent books in the archives. So while dying of boredom, Braun is while well, Braun is dying of boredom, excuse me, and Books is dying of frustration, they uncover a terrible, terrible conspiracy. Will they survive this peculiar occurrence? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Doomsday Vault is another steampunk that takes place in uh, London, and it follows Lady Alice Michaels, and she is not a proper Victorian lady, but at 21, she is a proper Victorian spinster. Her unnatural interest in automata of all sorts and her membership in a family plagued by the clockwork plague only diminish her chances at attaining a husband. So when a man finally approaches her, uh, interested in purchasing her title, basically, by marrying her, um, she goes ahead and says yes, only to find out later that this guy has some really gnarly secrets. Um, Gavin Enoch is the other main character in this so story, and he always wanted to be an airman, uh, and his dreams have come true, but then his ship gets taken by sky, uh, sky pirates, and he's now stranded in London with only his fiddle. So with nothing but his trusty fiddle, he's trying to earn money to get him back to America, and he is set upon by a group of uh, plague zombies and gets infected with the clockwork plague. But he doesn't succumb like most. He's one of the rare few that become clockwork geniuses. So uh, these geniuses produce amazing technology, some of which vastly improves the quality of life, and some of which literally threatens all life on the planet. There's this one character who's devising a cube that makes a sound that destroys time. So, the Doomsday Vault is where London keeps all of these, these terrible devices. Um, and it's, it's a great series. There's zombies, there's clockworkers, there's automata of all sorts. Great series, great book. Um, another one of my favorites is called The Native Star by M.K. Hobson. And this is another one that takes place in the American West. And in it, uh, Emily Edwards and Dreadnought Stanton are kind of at loose ends. Um, butting heads together. Emily is a small-time witch whose livelihood is being threatened by the larger affairs. Uh, people prefer to buy name-brand magic through the mail, and they assume it's stronger and more reliable. The trick is, in this world, the power of magic is based on belief, so the fact that they believe it works makes it work better. Though Emily is an earth witch, so her magic would work no matter what, so she's very frustrated. Um, she really needs money to help her ailing father, so she, since she's losing all of her business, she sets her sights on the richest man in town, and she's going to get him to marry her, come what may. She will resort to anything, including black magic. And unfortunately for her, during the ceremony, there's some terrible shenanigans, and she ends up with a magic-sucking stone in her hand. Um, this book has mining zombies, like they create zombies to go down to the mines because it's less dangerous because they're already dead, you know? Um, but the zombies kind of go on a rampage and she and Dreadnought Stanton flee across to the east coast to try and solve how to get this magic rock out of her hand. And it was, it was a great adventure. Um, and the best part I think about these zombies is there's a kill switch? You'll have to read to find out. It's awesome. <laughs> So when I was trying to think through for my favorites, I've been reading a lot of steampunk intentionally for this panel lately, but it occurred to me that it all went back to the aesthetic that had started drawing my attention um, 30, 40 years ago. So uh, my first favorite pick is the original Wild Wild West TV series. Um, if, if anybody was in the steampunk authors panel on Friday, there was a discussion of whether or not it stood up the test of time. It does. It's misogynistic and odd and crazy, but it's still fun to see the gadgets and to watch the interaction uh, between James West and Artemis Gordon. And um, again, shameless plug for the library, we do have 
the full series on DVD, so you can go back from the beginning and watch it. The first year is in black and white, but color after that. And if you want a little funky trivia, in the first season, um, I don't know if anybody remembers the entry, the screenshot that you can see of the, they did the different scenes and would cut out at the scenes, but the original opening, um, in the first season, James West, the, when the woman on the, the right kisses him and tries to kill him, in the first season, he just shoved her, and that was it. But in proceeding in the following seasons, he actually smacks her. So. <laughs> um, Ian Fleming is a genius. Um, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang is the bomb. I remember watching this year after year after year and never tiring of how pretty and cool and the gadgets and the inventions and things like that. So when I started thinking about the fundamentals of steampunk for me, this really came up as, as one of my all-time favorites and really got me into what I now think of as steampunk. So. I don't know if any of you guys have seen the Wired article a couple of years ago that allowed inside um, behind the scenes shots of Jay Walker's Library of the History of Human Imagination. This is my dream library. Um, I want this library. Um, I don't care that it's already Jay Walker's. Um, he's an entrepreneur and an inventor. Um, but this is the coolest library on the planet. Uh, aside from the steampunk aesthetic that you can see, it has some of the coolest artifacts and books imaginable. So I highly recommend just go out, Google, Jay Walker Library, you'll find the Wired article and you get all this behind the scenes. There's even a, somebody did a movie walkthrough and you can see how cool this is. Back to the basics, Sherlock Holmes. The invention of Sherlock Holmes by Arthur Conan Doyle, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, they really go back. It doesn't matter whether it's in book form, I've been listening to the audio books lately, um, any of the incarnations on the big and small screen, it's fun, and it's kind of one of those fundamentals of steampunk where scientific exploration and odd gadgets and intuition all were coming together. So I would highly recommend, you may not realize, if you go back to the books, that um, the stories really are solid. The things that have been carried forward in series and, and movie, um, they hold up really well to time. And then, um, if you're just getting into steampunk, I would recommend the Steampunk Gazette. It's kind of a, a catalog of all things cool and interesting about steampunk and talks about the movement um, around the world. And I'm a huge Gale Carragher fan, so I have to include both the Parasol Protectorate um, versions, and I'm excited to see one of the things that I didn't include in the coming up soon is she's going to be doing a Parasol Protectorate abroad following um, Ivy, and so it should be really interesting to see what she comes up with. Oh, I get some pics too. So, <laughs> a few more books for you guys. Uh, I wanted, I, I really like stuff that takes place in fantasy worlds that have a steampunk feel to them. Uh, and one of these is uh, Pretty Go Street Station by China Miebo. He has created this incredibly com complex, interesting world. Um, the city that it takes place in is called New Crobazon, and it feels like a Victorian London that is populated by alien races. Um, there are some there, there are some good steampunk elements. Uh, you've got automatons that gain artificial intelligence. Uh, they create a rudimentary uh, computer network through their human allies. Uh, my favorite part of this book is the monsters. Uh, there, there are monsters stalking the city. Uh, gigantic moths that mesmerize people with their hypnotic wing patterns, and just when your eyes are spinning, they, um, well, it's, it's pretty gross, but uh, <laughs> they suck out your soul, basically. They, they live on psychic energy. Um, I was listening to the audio version of this book one day, and my kids were in the other room watching My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, <laughs> and I looked over, and there was an episode on where there was a monarch butterfly and it was hypnotizing the ponies with its wings and I was like, oh my god, what's going on? It's a really scary book, it's really fun. Um, 
Alloy of Law by Brandon Sanderson. Emily mentioned it. She mentioned a steampunk jacuzzi. I don't remember that part. <laughs> um, but it, he, he did a really interesting thing with, uh, with the Mistborn series. The first three books are in the standard high fantasy um, medieval setting, and then he thought, hey, what if we advance that forward a few hundred years and see what this world is, is going to look like as it progresses, but with the same system of magic that's been created, and you know, to see how religion has uh, progressed. And uh, it ends up being really interesting. Uh, book four, then, is the Alloy of Law, and you can start with book four. Um, it has a distinctly steampunk feel to it. It's got a splash of western. Uh, there are pistols made of aluminum, giant elaborate machines that do things that I, I can't really tell you what they do because it would give away the book. And characters um, who are pushing against the restraints of Victorian society. So I really like that one. And then uh, The Good, the Bad, and the Infernal. I included this book on uh, our weird western panel that we did on Friday and I liked it so much that I brought it here too. Um, every 100 years, a town appears somewhere in the world for one day. Uh, it can take any form. It can show up anywhere. People say it's a gateway to heaven. But judging from the various monsters that seem to come out of it, uh, it is probably a gateway to somewhere else. And uh, so th that's sort of the mystery of it. But there are people who are uh, making their way towards it. It's, it's 1889. It's going to be a ghost town in the American West and these different bands are making their way there. Um, it's a steampunk western, and it's, it's got, the best thing about it is, is the eccentric characters. You've got a freak show pack of outlaws, complete with like a bearded lady. Um, there's a band of monks. Um, there's a, a, a Lord Forsyth, who's the inventor of the Forsyth Thunder Pack, and the Forsyth Land Carriage, which is a steam-powered train-like vehicle with three cars that kind of hurls them across the desert in a really dangerous way. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Um, before we move on to the next part, I do want to, we're, we're going to have very little time for discussion, but um, I do want to thank you guys for joining us. And I, I, I want to remind you, we do have a table upstairs outside the exhibit hall exit. Please stop by. We've got bookmarks with lists from all of our programs up there. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Steam Crow. Uh, they have a, a booth in the exhibit hall right in the front, and they loan Zach some goggles for our um, panel. So um, <laughs> yeah, we, we think they're awesome. They do great work. They're definitely worth checking out. So um, we want to hear from you guys. We've got just a couple minutes. Uh, we're in the process of updating our steampunk book list, which we have online. We wanted to know uh, what have we missed so far? What are your favorite titles that you'd like us included? We're going to make sure we get them in there. Yeah. So there's a graphic novel called The Five Fists of Science, mm -hmm. which is amazing, but it's like Nikola Tesla and Mark Twain joining forces to fight Thomas Edison and somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a robot battle. Edison's the bad guy. Yeah, Edison's the bad guy. It's, yeah, the bad guy. it's it was awesome. And I highly recommend it. Yeah, back in the back. Or, oh, right here. Uh, Cheryl Ender. I've been airship, and she's got another book coming out. So. Very cool. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to basically ask your opinion on something like because I have I forget the exact stories, but I kind of like what they did. Basically, it starts out as just a regular Victorian sort of novel, and then transitions to steampunk over the course. Like you're seeing where the change happens to make the world look uh, different from what it is. What's your opinion on those kinds? That sounds fabulous. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I know. What, what's, I think that's remembering. That's what's frustrating. Yes, sir. Uh, there's one out there, I can't remember who wrote it, that the book came to 14. And basically, it uh, starts off in this uh, apartment building. And they start, mm -hmm. one of the guys in the building starts realizing that you know the rooms are kind of weird and everything. Ends up being, well, I don't really want to get away. <laughs> no, that's good. We'll check it out. <laughs> and it goes into like, there's a little Cthulhu in there and nice. stuff. So it really turns into That sounds cool. Yeah. I actually have a question. If you had a friend that was all about the way before and you wanted to show them Steampunk, what would you give them? Weird West. Weird West. I give them Good, Bad, and Infernal. It's cool. It's, uh, th there's a lot of Weird West. We have a Weird West bookmark upstairs. Um, I've been living in the Weird West for the last three months. Have to <laughs> there's a lot of great books out there, and there's a lot of new stuff, too. I think you know. Yeah, I've been reading um, the Mammoth 
book of steampunk, which is like a bunch of very short stories about all the Yeah. Because I was also curious, it's not a book, but if any of you have seen Sky Captain and the Royal Tomorrow? Yeah. 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 I was like, oh, that was in the run of our film series. Yeah. Yeah, we, I, when Brett was saying that we weren't going to be comprehensive, there's a lot of stuff that's happening in Bioshock Infinite is getting a lot of press for its, its steampunk aesthetic. And, um, there's some cool things happening out there, but going back as early to this, where you had that, the puzzles and the gadgets. And, I'm like, I never solved anything. I just wandered around <laughs> for hours. Is, I, think we can do, I think I missed the whole point. Uh, yes? Uh, so what I'd like to bring up, there are two new television series out that have a very uh, friendly steampunk feel to them. One of them is Defiance for Sci-Fi, and the other one is Da Vinci's Demons. Uh, that one I think is HBO or something, so it's kind of like Stars. Stars, okay. Uh, but that one is fantastic. It's, it's uh, basically Da Vinci is coming up with all sorts of crazy contraptions, and it's very steampunk feel with the whole section. That sounds fantastic. Thanks. Okay, last one. Yeah, I think what we're going to have to do with our list is expand it to like a lot of fun. Right now we've got just uh, books and graphic novels on it, we're going to expand it out. So, I think we're out of time you guys, but thank you so much. If you guys have additional suggestions, we'll be upstairs at the DPL table right outside the exhibit hall for a little while, so you can add some more to this. Thank you.